Welcome to How to Shoot Better. Regardless of how much experience you have, whether you grew up with guns or not, whether you haven't bought a firearm, or maybe you've just bought your first Glock, your first AR-15, this is a series intended to take the average citizen and give them the knowledge that they need to train on their own so that they can be extremely comfortable and confident with their firearms. Contrary to popular opinion, you can teach yourself how to shoot. It's not extremely complicated. It can be very confusing what to work on when, what fundamentals you should focus on, how much you should clean your firearms, how you zero them, when you start trying to shoot on the move or speed up with your shooting versus maybe slow down. And we're gonna talk about and unpack all of those different things in this series so that at the end of all 10 episodes, you have a very thorough understanding of the things that you should be focusing on when you are starting to train with a handgun and with a rifle. For this series, we have chosen the two most popular types of firearms that you can find in the United States. We have a standard striker fire pistol. We will be subbing this handgun out for other models from other manufacturers throughout the series. But for this episode, we'll be using this Glock 19. And for the long gun, we will be using an AR-15, which is the most common and most popular rifle in the United States of America and for good reason, we will not be utilizing a shotgun or a Kalashnikov style rifle. Now keep in mind the fundamentals and the principles that we're gonna be talking about in this series definitely translate over to these other types of firearms. But if you're interested in learning more about those specific types of weapons, I would recommend Googling and finding other content on those guns and then coming back to the series if you're interested in the training content. Now, while you may see some flashy high-speed shooting in this series, it's important to note that that is not necessarily the goal of this series. Not everyone or every single person watching this video is interested in pursuing a super high level of shooting, a grandmaster competition level of shooting where you could go and win national championships. But there are, there is a level of skill that should be expected of carrying a firearm on your body, concealed carrying, or having a rifle and claiming that you want to own that rifle for the purpose of the Second Amendment. There are some basic skills that I believe you really should have so that you are truly an asset to the community and not just someone who thinks you have a trinket of invincibility that is just owning a firearm. So it really doesn't matter how far you want to take the skill of shooting. This series is designed and the videos and the drills and everything is built around the idea of giving you the basics and giving you the core of what you need to be a decent and competent shooter. How far you want to take that, how much time you want to invest in it, how much you want to dry fire, how much ammo you want to invest in and spend money on, that's ultimately going to come down to you. But ultimately, this series is the bare bones basics that I believe every gun owner should have to be a competent and well-rounded individual. So starting off, weapon safety. This is obviously the first thing that comes with everything and you're going to be exercising it at every single range day and every time you go to pick up a firearm. The four firearm safety rules that most of us are familiar with is treat every weapon as if it are loaded. If I come to my firearm that is on the table at my house, even if I have checked it hours before in dry fire, I'm still going to assume that that weapon could possibly be loaded. And when I go to pick that firearm up, if I'm going to commence in some dry fire practice or I'm just moving it throughout the house, I'm going to assume it is loaded and I am probably also going to check to make sure it is loaded or is not loaded. And the second rule, which most of you are also probably familiar with, is keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to fire. This one's very self-explanatory, but essentially what that's going to look like is if I am shooting, drawing a handgun, if I am presenting my rifle at low ready, or I'm moving with a weapon, my finger is going to be off the trigger until I'm actually presenting and moving to fire. The third rule is never aim your weapon at anything you're not willing to destroy. Now this particular rule needs a little bit more clarity around it because when we start talking about dry firing and what we're gonna be talking about in this episode, it is going to mean you're aiming your gun at something in your house, which does technically mean if you fire it around, that round is going to go through whatever you're aiming at, especially if it's a wall, and that round is going to travel into the next room. So at some level, this rule, there is some room for interpretation. It is on, based on a case-by-case -case basis. But what it means is you're not aiming your firearm at another person. You're not doing it in, for some humorous reason. You're not doing anything that is, with common sense, unsafe. But ultimately, we are going to be aiming our guns at different things. 
as we're training or as we're dry firing that technically, yeah, we probably don't want to shoot a hole through the drywall, but that's just sort of a risk that we're going to be taking in dry firing in our house. We're not necessarily going to restrict dry firing to just the range where it is a more safe environment. We are still going to dry fire in the house, but there's some things we can do to mitigate the risk. So that particular uh, firearm safety rule does require a little bit of a little bit of common sense to go with it because it's not always a clear black and white. And the last safety rule is always be aware, be aware of your target's foreground and background. And what that means is when I am pulling out my firearm to shoot a target on the range, I know what is in front of the target, what might possibly pass in front of my muzzle, or what is beyond that target. Do I have a berm that I'm shooting into? Is there someone downrange already pacing targets? Um, am I just not shooting in a very safe environment where I could be sending around into another person's property and kill a cow or something like that? So that rule, again, it's also, there's a lot of common sense to go with it because you'll also see high level individuals training in a range environment where there might be some people down range of the shooter, but that shooter is still aware of his target's foreground and background that he is engaging. So he can still engage that target safely, even with guys down range. With those four firearm safety rules in mind, there is zero reason you should be scared of firearms. Now you might be concerned about someone else in your presence who is misusing a firearm or is maybe not observing the four firearm safety rules. And that's not always within your control. But what we can control is our level of confidence and capability with a firearm. Firearms should be respected for what they are. They are dangerous weapons and they are weapons. I will not be classifying these as guns throughout the series as some firearms instructional institutions like to talk about them, kind of sugarcoat what they are. Uh, these are weapons. They are designed to be as deadly and lethal as possible. Uh, that is why law enforcement are issued firearms. It is why militaries have firearms. And it's also why civilians should have firearms too. There's nothing wrong with possessing a violent instrument to protect yourself and others. So we'll be referencing these as weapons throughout the series because that is absolutely what they are. And if you understand how to use them and you properly respect them, there is no reason to fear them. So with all of that in mind, the first thing that we're going to do when we have our new firearms at home, maybe our existing firearms, is we are going to commence in some weapons handling drills or training, whatever you want to call it. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ensure the weapons are unloaded. So I have my AR-15 right here. We are not going to discuss all of the different manipulation and controls that each of these weapons have. I would recommend you go and Google if you have a specific type of rifle that might be a little bit different if you want to learn those. To be honest though, if you just sit down with a firearm and you kind of mess around with it, you're going to learn what each part on the gun, what it does. And I highly recommend that your standard of proficiency with this weapon be, you can articulate or manipulate every single component on the rifle blindfolded. So in this case, I'm going to use the mag release to eject the magazine. I'm then going to pull the charging handle, which on Air 15, it's located up top, to observe into the breech to make sure that the weapon is truly unloaded. I'll also observe into the mag well to ensure I have no magazine in there because that's where a lot of people make the mistake of they go to check the breech first, they see there's no bullet, they forget to remove the magazine, they chamber around, and then when they go to drop the hammer, they end the inside their house. We obviously don't want that to happen. If you want, you can even lock the bolt to the rear to just properly ensure that the weapon is truly unloaded, and this weapon is now safe for training and use. On a handgun, it's gonna look very similar. I have the handgun that I've just picked up, I'm going to assume this weapon is loaded. I'm gonna try not to point it in the direction of anybody. I may just point it at the floor. I'm going to remove the magazine using the magazine release, pull the slide to the rear, locking it if I am familiar with the controls on the pistol, observe into the breech, see that there is nothing, observe into the mag well, there is no magazine in the gun, and this weapon is now confirmed empty and ready for training. Again, if I set the guns down, go off and do some stuff, I've got other people in the house and I come back to them, I'm probably going to check the guns all over again to ensure they are actually unloaded. I've heard plenty of stories of people walking away, someone else in the house, a roommate or someone comes around, plays around with the gun, sticks the loaded mag in, and they come back and an ND ultimately occurs. So again, as soon as you set the weapon down and it leaves your control, when you come back, make sure the weapon's actually empty and checked. In time, this is gonna become subconscious. It's just gonna become second nature. It's not gonna be paranoia. It's just gonna be, you pick up a gun, you check it. Someone hands you a gun to look at, you check it. That's just how the system works. So the second thing to get figured out on your rifle, after you get your controls all figured out, you understand how your collapsing buttstock works, you understand how to turn on your optic or flip up your iron sights if that's what you're using. The first thing that we need to get familiar with is 
safety use. So on standard AR-15s, you generally will have a safety that is manipulated on one side of the rifle, sometimes on the other side as well, if it's ambidextrous and maybe you're a lefty. And it is going to rotate from a safe position where the trigger will not, you cannot fire the weapon, it is perfectly safe. When you flick the safety to a 90 degree or 45 degree angle, the weapon is now on fire in semi-auto. It's unfortunately not full auto, but we actually wouldn't want that on a gun like this necessarily. Uh, we will now be on fire every time I pull the trigger, I will fire around, provided the gun doesn't jam. A lot of new gun owners, when they get a rifle like an AR-15 or any rifle out there, will immediately go to the range, start shooting, but they're not necessarily comfortable or competent utilizing the safety. And what I'm talking about is, if I am not presenting the weapon at a target, if I am not actively engaging an array of targets, my safety is going to be on. And the rule of thumb for this is, when my eyes go into the optic, my safety comes off. When my eyes leave the optic, my safety comes on. And the reason for this is, rifles don't have holsters. The trigger is exposed, it is unprotected. If I go to sling the rifle and I'm wearing a chest rig or kit, or maybe no kit at all, and I'm just walking around pacing up targets, that trigger is exposed either to other people or to debris, and the weapon could go off. And I know of instances in which this has happened, it hasn't happened to me, because I use a safety, but the safety is there to just keep the rifle safe and you know not just firing into the ground into your feet. So as long as the trigger guard doesn't have some sort of like holster and there's no like system to protect that, that's what the safety is for. And on most rifles, you can articulate the safety just as fast as, like there's, there's gonna be no time delay. Uh, if I am starting from a ready position and then I need to shoot, with training, you will be subconscious and you're not gonna lose any time hitting the safety while bringing the gun to your eye. If you make the decision that you need to shoot from a retention position and actually articulate the safety and then fire, you could do that too, but for the most part, you're gonna be getting a sight picture and you're gonna be deactivating the safety while you bring the gun to presentation. This is the first thing that you need to do probably 500 times in your house for the course of probably two or three weeks. It's simply starting with the rifle, again, getting comfortable grabbing the rifle in a consistent position. We're not trying to overextend our arm. We want a slight bend in the elbow so we can control recoil nicely. We wanna keep the buttstock positioned low in our shoulders so the buffer tube is not shooting over the top. We want to maintain positive pressure, pulling the gun tight into the shoulder so there's no slop when I actually go to live fire. And all I'm going to do is work the safety. Gun comes to my eye, gun comes away, safety goes on, safety comes off, safety goes on. And I'm going to do this 500 times over the course of two weeks to the point that now I never have to think about the safety. It just happens. If I'm shooting a target and then I decide to move, the safety just comes on and it's always on. The only time it may not be on is on a rifle transition because the bolt is actually possibly on a malfunction, is, uh, it's actually not locked to the rear and the safety won't actually, can't manipulate the safety when the weapon is not actually in battery. So there are some weird instances like that, but for the most part, your safety should be on when your eyes are not in the optic. And this can all be practiced at home before you've even fired a single shot. Another part of this process in getting familiar with just picking up the rifle and shouldering it and assuming a shooting stance is starting with the rifle on a table. What this does, and we'll get into this on the handgun as well, is this is ensuring that I have a complete reset, a full reset, every time I'm going to pick up the rifle and assume a shooting stance that I am comfortable with. And so I really like a table pickup drill, especially for new shooters, because it requires a full reset and everything. And how I'm picking up the rifle, where I put it into my shoulder, articulating the safety, safety comes off, return the rifle to the table. And what I'm thinking about is, where my shooting hand needs to go, where my support hand needs to go, when I'm hitting the safety, and where I put my butt stock. And again, if you do this hundreds of times, you are gonna be so much more comfortable than the people that go out and try to shoot the first day they buy a rifle. Like, put in the time getting familiar with your weapons handling, because that is the thing that sets good shooters and novice shooters apart the most. When I go to the range or I'm training a, whether it's a law enforcement agency, which I've done in the past, or a military unit, the first thing that I do when I'm working with people is I judge their weapons handling. Generally, that shows who is the most proficient and most skilled with a firearm. You're never gonna have a high-level shooter who just sucks with weapons handling, who's just like flagging everyone and just doing stupid stuff. Uh, but you usually will have the people who shoot the worst are gonna be the people who just have spent the, less, the least amount of time on a firearm, definitely the least disciplined time on a firearm, and they will generally have the worst weapons handling manipulation overall. So drills like this are super great. I've got a rifle on the table, it's a full reset. I'm gonna grab the rifle, bring it to my shoulder, safety comes off, get a sight picture, 
I'm not even pressing the trigger. Don't have to do that yet. I'm just getting comfortable and confident manipulating a rifle so that I can be comfortable with the weapon. As far as a pistol goes, it's going to look very similarly. The big thing that we're going to be working on, again, before we fired a single round, is making sure that we have a good grip on the handgun. So what we want to do, and there's lots of videos out there you can watch on this, but I'm going to summarize. We want to have the highest grip into the handgun as possible with our shooting hand, whether it's your right hand or your left hand. We are then going to take our support hand and we are going to fill the space as best as possible and squeeze as tight as possible. You can't squeeze too tight with your left hand. It's just, it's not really, uh, nobody's really doing that. We're going to squeeze as tight as possible and this is going to give us a good, good recoil management when we actually go to live fire. And one of the issues with dry fire or doing anything like this in the house is you might, you know, in your house you're dry firing with a really loose grip because you're not firing. There's no resistance. There's no recoil. And then you go to the range and the gun's jumping all around. So try to remember every time I am presenting the pistol for a rep or I'm picking the pistol up off of a table to assume that full firing grip because I want a full reset uh, for a full rep. I want to make sure that I'm gripping just as tight as I would want to if I were actually shooting live ammo on the range. And this table drill is particularly useful with the handgun, especially if you haven't started training with a holster, because I'm getting a full reset of the rep of grabbing the pistol, getting a good grip, finding my sights, pistol, and that's what it's going to look like. And again, I would do this 500 times to have a very consistent grip on the handgun. The other thing we're working on, just like on the rifle, and I guess I didn't touch on this, but this is the other thing that we're working on, is trigger control. If you haven't been around firearms a lot, or you haven't shot firearms a lot, this is the time to be practicing our trigger control. Because for some people, especially you know, growing up around toy guns, maybe you just ran around with your finger on the trigger all the time, I know I did, you may have a habit of just always having your finger in the trigger guard. And that is not something we want to do when we start shooting with live ammo. So this time handling weapons on a table is the perfect time to go, no, I'm going to pick the handgun up, I'm going to aim it at the target, or I'm just going to assume a good firing grip for one full rep of building familiarity with the handgun, and I'm going to keep my finger off the trigger. And you do it again. And you do this hundreds of times, and that's going to ingrain in your mind how to hold a firearm, whether it's a pistol or a rifle, with your finger off the trigger. And this is before we've even gotten into shooting any live ammo or drawing from a holster. I'm building the habit of keeping my finger off the trigger because I've talked to so many people who they have a handgun, they haven't started carrying the handgun or they haven't started drawing from a holster and they're concerned that when they draw they may throw their finger in the trigger guard. And that is a very realistic concern and yes, very detrimental if you actually do it. So that's why we practice without a holster or just practice with a dry gun, practicing our trigger management. Just picking up a handgun, handling it. It might be finger on the trigger guard, you know, while I'm aiming at something on the wall, finger off, finger on, finger off. And you do this 500 times. This is the kind of training right here that leads to a high degree of firearms competence and confident weapons handling. It is not cool looking. It is boring. It probably looks really dorky to pick a rifle up off a table and set it back down and do it again and do it again and do it again. But this is the kind of thing that will make you so much more effective with a a handgun or rifle and make your live fire session when you actually do go to the range to live fire ammo much more productive. Now you're probably wondering, uh, you just talked about trigger control and, and using a safety and building a grip on a handgun, but you haven't talked about pulling the trigger, like actually dry firing the gun. And that is because we're trying to stack certain things for you to focus on, right? We're not trying to do everything all at once. We're just focusing on a couple things at once so that you can really get them down. If you start trying to do everything all at once, a draw, also building your grip, keeping your finger off the trigger, but then putting it on the trigger once you're at you know, a full sight picture, and then pressing the trigger on a target, and then how you're using your sights. Well, we're talking about six different things that you're having to worry about all at once, which most people, especially new gun owners, are not going to succeed at doing very well. They'll, they'll succeed at a couple of the things, like they'll get the gun out, their grip will probably suck, trigger press probably won't be great, and they're gonna get a sloppy rep or they're really not focusing on one or two things. Most people can really only focus on one or two things at once, which is why we isolate out safety use. That is all we're gonna do. Safety comes on, I get a sight picture. Safety comes off, or safety comes on. Safety comes off, safety comes on. Safety comes off, safety comes on. I'm not trying to press the trigger. I'm not even necessarily trying to put the optic on a specific target. I'm just thinking about the safety and that is all I'm doing. And when I first started shooting, that is, I, 
played with guns all the time without live firing, but it built that familiarity with firearms so that when I actually went and started to live fire, I could focus solely on the live fire. I didn't have to worry about my safety use. I didn't have to worry about when my finger was off the trigger. I remember filming myself with a slow-mo camera because I was going, am I actually keeping my finger off the trigger when I draw, when I do certain things? Because when I'm shooting, I'm not paying attention to that. And I would scrub the slow-mo footage and go, no, no, I'm good. My finger's off the trigger while I'm drawing on a timer. Or, yep, my finger's off the trigger when I'm presenting my rifle. But I had to go film myself because I wasn't sure if I was doing it or not. And that's ultimately what you want. You want to be having it run in the background at a point where you're just never having to think about it so that you can focus on the next part of the puzzle, which is a good trigger press, uh, not disturbing your sights while you're actually firing or anything else that's gonna be happening while you're live firing. Now, you will have noticed that I have a red dot on this rifle, on this uh, PSA rifle that I have, and I have iron sights on this pistol. So in the past, I would recommend to people that they should start with iron sights. They should learn iron sights before they upgrade to a red dot or some other type of optic. I would recommend a red dot though. I wouldn't go straight to the magnified. And I've kind of changed my tune a little bit, and here's why. When you are shooting with iron sights as a new shooter, it is very hard to discern what is actually going on with the gun. It is very hard to discern how your sight picture is actually moving while you're pressing the trigger, whether you're flinching the trigger, whether you're manipulating the gun in some other way while you're firing it, adding extra input. With a red dot, whether it's on a handgun or a rifle, it will be very easy or much easier to discern what's going on with the gun while you're shooting it because you can see your sight, everything below your sight picture and you only have one point you're having to focus on or you're not really focused on it, it's your, your dot. It's just kind of floating there, but you'll see it flash to the left, flash to the right, or, or go upwards for some weird reason. And then you can start to do some diagnosis. So I actually recommend if you are a new shooter, starting with a red dot. I know that sounds a little crazy, and it's definitely, the future is now old man, but starting with a red dot will actually allow you to properly understand or more easily understand what's going on with the gun and lead to more efficient training in the long run. I would then say later on, go to iron sights on your rifle, your standard M4, iron sights and learn kind of what those look like, even though very few people are really using those anymore, uh, and learn iron sights on a handgun. But I would actually recommend, if you can pony up the money, going out and buying a red dot, a simple red dot, something that is just a single dot. It could have a bullseye reticle. I would recommend starting with a single dot and use that to properly discern what's actually going on with the gun when we go to start live firing. You'll also notice it in dry fire too. If you are shooting a handgun, and you're squeezing the trigger and your sight picture is moving, you will see that in dry fire with a red dot. You don't always see it with iron sights, especially if you're a new shooter. So that might be a little, uh, little bit of a new concept to some folks, but I have found that highly effective for new shooters and even moderately good shooters to be training with a red dot more than iron sights. You could just see more information, you can discern what's going on better, and that's going to lead to more efficient training reps so that you can get better sooner. So that's the first thing to work on if you're a new gun owner. Your basic weapons handling, your safety manipulation on your rifle or on your handgun, if your handgun has one, and if you are going to be doing that, and then your trigger management as well. Keeping your finger off the trigger until you're ready to fire, until that weapon is presented or until you're taking up the slack on the trigger and you're actually going to take a shot. The next episode, we are gonna be talking about zeroing, as that is going to be the next thing you're gonna to wanna to do before you actually get into training. And then we're gonna be walking through the process on all the different drills, different things you should be doing. But this right here is a couple weeks worth of work, two or three weeks worth of work to build that subconscious cognitive process, or muscle memory, which is what some people like to call it, of handling your weapons in a safe manner and a professional manner without having to think about it. It just runs in the background and you never have to think about it again. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.